Well, good morning, everybody, as we, we get ready to come together to worship the Almighty God. Welcome to Community, yeah, Canal Town Community Church. I was just going to call it Community Church a second ago. Welcome to Canal Town Community Church. As, as the fall weather starts to come in, I got one more, at least one more motorcycle ride in the other day. It was 48 degrees, a little, little chilly for it, but, but uh, I don't want to give up on the, on the spring and the summer yet. So welcome, welcome as we gather together. So let's, let's, um, let's gather together then to worship God. I'm going to read just a, a couple of verses from Psalm 68 that I think are appropriate as we, as we begin our time in worship. It says, sing to God, sing praise to his name, extol him who rides on the clouds. His name is the Lord and rejoice before him. That's really, you know, we're going to be talking about prayer today and the surprises, sometimes a surprise that we didn't care for as well as the surprises that we, we rejoice about. But God is in control, and God knows what he is doing. So there is reason to rejoice even when times look grim, because God is in control. So if you're able, let's stand together as we worship God in song. <laughs> So wonderful is your unfailing love. Your cross is spoken mercy over me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart can fully know how glorious, how beautiful you fills the skies your mighty works displayed for all to see the beauty of your majesty awakes my heart to sing how marvelous how wonderful you are beautiful one I love beautiful one Nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. You opened my eyes to your wonders anew. You captured my heart with this love. Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. I'm 
God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Amen. And please be seated. Let's, let's go before the Lord. Almighty God, again, we thank you for your grace and your mercy in our lives. We thank you, Almighty God, that you, you are high and lifted up. You deserve all the glory. And Lord, sometimes we cloud it by our own actions. Almighty God, I pray that you will help us to see you, that we might know you. Lord, that we might recognize that you are with us day by day by day. That Lord... Nothing is done out of your sight. That, Lord, we might look to you for wisdom and for guidance and for strength. Almighty God, we think of those who, who need a special touch from you, Jeff, who has still been suffering from the, the remnants of the COVID-19. We pray that you'll just uh, bring him back to full health. Lord, that you are in charge and that you can do it with a snap of your finger, with, with a whisper of your word. And so, Lord, he is in your hands. We pray that you'll continue to be with Cindy and Lauren as they, they finish the remnants of that, all gone for them, all clear. But still, uh, sometimes after we've gone through that, we can be weak. So, Lord, strengthen them. Lord, pray for, for Eric and, and Gout. I, I've gone through that. I just pray, Almighty God, that you'll relieve that that you'll just ease the pain from that and just bring healing there. Almighty God, watch over us now as we look into your word. Lord, as we look at the power of prayer and the surprises of prayer and that, Lord, some of the, the things that we don't like about the results of prayer, but knowing, Lord, that you are good and that your purposes are perfect. So, Lord, be with us now. Take over, Lord. Hide me behind the cross that we might hear from you. And these things we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. If you will, we're going to have the scripture up on the, the, the monitors, but if you want to turn in your own copy of scriptures, you're welcome to. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 16. I'm reading from the New International Version. It reads, It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And when he saw that this had pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Get up, quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and then came to an iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. And when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. And when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, many, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came and answered the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting it was so, they said, it must be his angel. So Peter kept on knocking. But when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Today we're going to be looking at this idea of prayer and and 
what kind of prayer God looks for and, and how God answers prayer. And, and I've asked the girls if they would stay and sing a song that you, you've heard before, but it's a song that you can listen to and meditate on because it kind of incorporates a lot that we're going to be talking about today. That even if God doesn't answer the prayer that we're looking for, he still is in control. He still is holy. He still is a caring God who, who has our best interest in his mind. So just listen, meditate, if you will, think about what God is doing in your life as the girls sing the song, Even If. They say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. And right now, right now I'm losing back I've stood on this stage night after night Reminding the broken it'll be alright But right now, oh right now I just can't It's easy to sing when there's nothing to bring me down. But what will I say when I'm held to the flame like I am right now? I know you're able and I know you can save the choose to leave mountains unmovable. Oh, give me the strength to be able to sing it is well.
Amen. Good reminder for us as we consider prayer in the verses that we looked at this morning. Uh, last week, and there is a, a, a direct connection, if you will, with where we were last week. Last week, we were in Acts 11, and we saw how God sometimes uses the evil actions of others to accomplish a greater goal. Last week's example was how the gospel was spread outside the confines of Jerusalem due to the persecution that took place after Stephen's stoning. God and Jesus in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 said, hey, you are to be my witnesses and this is where you're supposed to go. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the other parts of the world. But they all found themselves staying in Jerusalem. The persecution came and that caused the, the gospel to be spread throughout the lands. And we also saw how God used the last person on earth that he would, we would expect to use to spread the gospel. A, a Pharisee named Saul, Roman name Paul, who was against Christians, but God said, that's the one. And so God uses people for his glory and to accomplish his goals. He uses circumstances that he either brings about or that he allows, because I want to make sure we differentiate. God doesn't say, oh, I'm going to get this person beat up, but he knows what's going to happen, and God uses that for a, a greater good, and sometimes it's very hard for us to, to, to understand that greater good. It's, we're going through it, and we just, it just doesn't feel right. You know, God, how could me being beat up help? But, but God somehow uses it, and, and quite frankly, we could spend a lot of time looking at Paul's life, Saul, again, Paul, um, as his ministry unfolds in the book of Acts, he goes through his different missionary journeys, ultimately to where he is imprisoned. And then, although Acts doesn't talk about it, tradition tells us that he was ultimately executed in, in Rome. But um, I decided not to delve into that as we, as we start to finish up on our time in Acts, because we're going to have plenty of time to look at Paul's life and Paul's ministry as we look in the future at the various letters that he wrote, the, the 13 epistles, if you will, that Paul wrote that are contained in our New Testament. But today I want to consider prayer and the many ways that, that God surprises us. And quite frankly, it's, it's appropriate, I think, for us to to go to this focus after our initial look at this man named Saul, and as I said, carried the Roman citizen name of Paul. The name Saul, the Hebrew name Saul, means asked for or prayed for. The Roman name, the Latin name Paul, means humble or small. So these two contrasts for one who is prayed for and then one who is humble. Before his conversion on the road to Damascus, Saul was a proud, zealous persecutor of Christians. He, he saw himself as, I'm the one God's going to use. I'm, I'm, I'm the best one. He, he was brash. He was outspoken. And quite frankly, he was out to kill Christians. You know, very strong in his, in his approach. But as Paul... He was humble and strong in his servitude to God, but humble in his attitude. And so in the beginning of our book in Acts, the focus is on Saul as a persecutor of Christians. But after his conversions, the focus becomes on his name, Paul. And so Saul's name is no longer used. It's just Paul, the one that is humble that God is using. The one that God said, I will show him how much he must suffer for me. Oh, again, it's not the job description that I would like. But for some reason, God chooses to use prayer, prayer of believers, to influence or accomplish his purposes. It, it's a hard thing. You know, God, why don't you just do it? Well, there, there are times where God just does things. But for some reason, God said, pray, pray. And so there's a reason for that. And I, I want to I make sure you don't misunderstand where I'm going with this. It's, it's, it's not saying that God won't do anything without prayer. But last week we talked about Esther briefly, Esther from the Old Testament scriptures, how Esther was put in a position where she could influence, that she could take actions to save the Jews that a man named Haman wanted to have killed 
But when she was first approached by it, what did she say? <laughs> really, not my job. <laughs> I, you know, it's dangerous. I don't want to do it. But her cousin Mordecai said, hey, how do you not know that maybe God put you in a position that you're in for such time as this? But if you don't, God will still accomplish it. But you will perish. And the idea I suggested was that, that if, if I don't allow myself to be used by God for his purposes, God's still going to accomplish his perfect will. But I'm going to lose the blessing. And quite frankly, and I think I've said this in the past, I have found myself at times where I have um, been asked to pray for somebody. And it was one of those things, you know, kind of in the passing, oh, well, you know, pray for me, whatever it is. And, and I, yeah, yeah, I'll pray for you. And then I forget. <laughs> I didn't pray. And then sometime later, that person came to me and said, thank you for praying for me. I'll tell you what, this is what God did. And it was kind of like, do I tell him that I didn't pray? <laughs> you know, it was kind of like, wow, God said, you know, Chris, if you're going to drop the ball, other people aren't. And so I, I, in that sense, lost the blessing of being part of what God was doing. In Saul's life, I would suggest somebody was praying for him. Don't know who. Can't, can't say from the scriptures it says this, but Christians were being persecuted. Christians were dying at the hands of Paul. And it is likely that there were Christians that were saying, change his heart. Change his focus. Maybe some were saying, take him out. <laughs> but people were praying. And, and God knew that Saul had an opened heart. Yes, he was doing bad things, and Paul said he was, he was persecuting Christians out of his zeal for God, but zeal without knowledge. He was doing it for all the wrong reasons. But God knew that his zeal for him, if transferred into a right understanding, recognizing what the prophets were proclaiming from times past, that Paul would be an amazing instrument for him. I, I can only imagine what would happen, and I, by the way, I'm guilty here, what would happen if believers around the United States spent time every day praying for our political leaders? Conservative, Republican, independent, conserv um, um, far left, far right. If we were praying for them, what would happen in this world? Not a prayer that, I pray that this politician will fall off a cliff, or, or I pray that this politician will see things the way I see them. You know, not, not a self-serving, want, I want them to be like me. <laughs> Rather, a prayer that God will open their eyes and direct their path, that, that God will give them wisdom that God will give them understanding, that God will use them to somehow bring glory to his name. I don't know about you, but I fear for the way our country is going. And all the more reason for us to be praying. It's hard to pray for someone that you think is against you. And I'm not trying to make a political statement here. It's just, it's hard to pray when you look at someone and you say, oh, this person is evil. Um, Yet, we got to remember that we too are sinners saved by grace. That yet for the grace of God, we could be the ones doing the wrong thing. And quite frankly, sometimes in our name of God, we do the wrong things. Because we forget to consider God's approach rather than our own. And so, we need to think about prayer in that sense. That we need to pray for those who are against us as well as those that are for us and allow God to do great things. Yet, when we looked at our text today, there is a bit of a challenge. It's, it's, a, it's a chain of events. It follows a chain of events that, that take place after the dispersion, after uh, Stephen's persecution, after Saul's ministry in Antioch. The opening verse that we read said it was about this time, about the time after, again, after the ministry at Antioch. It says, about this time, King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. So we get from this verse that, that 
Herod arrested a number of believers. It doesn't say how many. It just says that he, 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 he per- grabbed several of them. One of them, James, the brother of John, wants to differentiate between James, the brother of Jesus. James, the brother of John, he, he executes. There's, there's no indication that there was a trial. There's no indication that um, charges were made and, and there was a witnesses and testimony either way. It's just the king's prerogative. He just said, okay, kill him. And, and the reaction of the masses was one of approval. They got excited about this. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. You know, it's, it's this bloodthirst that comes out that's pretty incredible. And all this happened during the time leading up to the Passover. There's the Feast of Unleavened Bread that, that takes, a, a, there's actions that they take prior to leading up to the Passover. And it appears that because of the sensitivity to the Passover ritual and the, the requirements leading up to that, that Herod could not act as quickly with Peter. He, he grabbed Peter. He was, uh, Peter was the, probably the most outspoken one of the Christian apostles that were testifying about Jesus Christ. But he, he could not act quickly. And we were told that after arresting Peter, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So here's the challenge. James was quickly executed, and Peter goes to jail to await trial. And we are told that Peter was well guarded. In other words, Herod was concerned of what might happen. Will the, will the believers rise up and, and go after him? So he was concerned. So there were 16 guards assigned to secure him, to make sure that he did not get away. We also learn that Peter was bound with shackles, on his hands, possibly even his feet. And when it came time to go to sleep, what happened? He slept between two guards. Not the most comfortable, it's not the Motel 6 of of the day. Sleeping between two guards. However, it's the briefest statement that is made in our text that I think is the most important. It comes from verse 5 where it says, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. There was an assembly, the ecclesia, the, a group of believers, those called out, that were fervently praying for Peter. And it was not just as sometimes we are guilty of, I am guilty of, it was not just a quick prayer. Uh, Lord, be with Peter. Uh, Lord, help Peter. Lord, Lord, uh, make his trial go well. It, it was a wholehearted, it's an earnestly, a wholehearted, constant prayer for a man that they knew and they loved. The point that I get from this is that prayer should not be an afterthought. It should not be something we just throw up really quickly. I, you know, my, my grandkids will sometimes kid me because they'll say, uh, oh, you know, my prayer is going to be long before, for, before a meal. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> you know, they're actually, they're all very gracious of it. And I've, I've, I've brought my prayers down to a little bit less time. But anyways... <laughs> It worries me when somebody says, especially at a church fellowship gathering, they'll say, okay, so-and-so is going to give us a quick prayer before we eat. It was, Let's get it over with. Prayer should not be an afterthought. No, you don't want to wait for the food to get cold. I agree with that. But it, prayer should be something that is near and dear to our heart because it's our opportunity to speak to God and that for God to listen. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything but in everything. By prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. I still remember, I was a fairly new believer. I was a janitor at Eastman Kodak Company after I got out of the military. Times were tough. Uh, House, home, mortgage were 15% um, uh, annually. Uh, Gas was short. It was really a tough time in, in the world. And I needed to get a job, and I got a job as a janitor. And I met this one guy, Noel. I can still remember his name. Noel, he was a machinist. No, he was not a machinist. He was a guy that did inspections for quality control. And he was a believer, and, and I would talk to him, and we'd have these great conversations. And one day he was talking to me about, well, he said, you know, I was, we needed a new refrigerator. And he said, I was at Sears. And, and so we, you know, got the pricing and things like that. And so the salesman was trying to say, okay, you know, so how do you want to pay for this? And he said, well, you know, thank you, but, but I need to pray about this first. And... Uh, When he said that to me, I thought, look, you need a refrigerator. What do you got to pray about? (laughs) But in everything, by prayer and supplication, make your request known to God. And and so 
it was one of those things that I have to be honest, it was kind of like, that seems stupid. <laughs> but, but he had it right. I'm going to make sure that I'm, I'm going the right direction. Maybe, maybe, somebody's, maybe somebody's always going to say, by the way, i got a refrigerator I don't need anymore. Would you like it? <laughs> God is in control. And, and so prayer should not be an afterthought. It should be our first thought. Likewise, prayer should not be, and boy, we, we, a lot of times we're guilty of this, prayer should not be self-gratifying. In for myself, James chapter 4, verses 2 through 3 also says, you do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You know, sometimes I'd like to say, Lord, give me a million dollars suddenly deposited in my bank account. That would be wonderful. <laughs> it's, yeah, that's, that's self-gratifying. And God's not going to answer that prayer as, as much as I might fervently pray for it, as much as I might believe that God is going to do it. But it is a puffed-up prayer that is seeking only for myself. We should not be praying for people that hurt us by saying, Lord, humble that person before me, or Lord, make that person's life miserable until they come back and, and say they apologize to me. Lord, my neighbor makes too much noise, burn his house down. <laughs> those, those are not prayers that God is going to answer. Those are, those are selfish prayers. Rather, our prayers should be, Lord, help me love the unlovable. Help me to see people through your eyes. James also wrote, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Think about the people that you most admire. It's not the ones that are always bragging about how wonderful they are. It's not the ones that are always showing you and flaunting, look at this, I got this, and oh, don't you wish you had this? And, you know, those are not the people that you say, oh, I want to be just like that person. You, you might like some of the things they have, but they're, they're, they're bolsterous, they're, they're braggadocious, that, you know, it... You don't like that. The people we most admire are those people that seem to work behind the scenes and they help others. I still remember a good friend of mine, actually one of my best friends in high school, he, in his, probably in his 20s, he was rooming, he shared an apartment with another friend of ours in Providence, I believe Providence, Rhode Island, I believe is where it was. But, um, or no, it was Providence, Massachusetts. Uh, Providence Town, Providence Town, that's where it was. And uh, he said one day, his friend came into the house soaking wet. His clothes were all wet and things like that. And he goes, whoa. And, and his friend just came and said, yeah, I was just out. Never said anything about why he was wet. Just went and changed and things like that. Later, my friend found out that Rob had seen someone drowning and without stopping, jumped in and saved the person. Never talked about, oh, yeah, I just saved somebody's life. He just did it. Rob later became a state trooper and probably helped a whole bunch of people. But those are the kind of people you admire versus the one that say, oh, I, I saw somebody and I, I called 911 to save somebody, whatever. It was the person that actually acted. Those are the people that we are drawn to. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Peter had an army of people crying out to God for his life, people that were humble before God, seeking for what Peter needed. And we know from the scriptures that God had great plans for Peter's life, great plans for Peter's ministry. But we also know that Peter, also called Simon, had a target on his back. Satan desired to destroy Peter. Jesus had said to Simon, Luke chapter 22, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. What's interesting about that prayer, that, that statement that Jesus made to Simon, to Peter, was that Jesus recognized that, that Peter would fail, that Peter would fall, but God in prayer does not give up. Because he said, when you have turned back, wait a second, I haven't turned, I haven't turned away. Jesus knows what's going to happen. When you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Peter would later deny Jesus. And Satan was there to destroy Peter's testimony. If only I can take away his testimony, he's not going to be, you know, you denied Jesus. 
Why are you proclaiming this guy you denied? You're, you're a bad guy. Satan was using that in an attempt to destroy his testimony, but prayer won the battle. Peter was restored by Christ and became a champion of the gospel. But it was prayer, in this case, Jesus' prayer, that ushered in the victory. So here we have Peter in prison, shackled, guarded by 16 soldiers, and people were praying for God's intervention. And an amazing miracle took place. Peter was set free. The sha- try to create an image in your mind of what's happening. As you're, you see him in this dark prison, 16 guards in different areas, sleeping between two, and all of a sudden his shackles fall off his hands. The guards next to him, whether they were sleeping or not, they didn't notice anything. Remember, there's an angel that whacked Peter. You know, sometimes, sometimes it hurts. It says the angel smacked him on the side. Get up! Kind of an abrupt waking. Get dressed! And so there is Peter passing through various groups of of soldiers, of guards there to make sure that there's no escape. Locked gates opened up by themselves, if you will, magically. What were his friends praying? Lord, protect Peter. Lord, kill Herod. Lord, protect us because they're going to come after us next. All we know is it says they were fervently, earnestly praying for Peter. And they were praying to God for Peter. So we don't know exactly what they prayed, but we do know that God acted. And once he was set free, Peter did exactly what you would expect him to do. Probably what you and I would do. He immediately went to a place where he knew he would find his friends. Quite frankly, he, he couldn't wait to tell them what happened. He wanted to give a testimony. This is amazing. There I was. And an angel hit me. And I walked through all the guards. And the date opened up in front of us. You know, what a testimony to share, this incredible miracle. And what happens next is almost, well, quite frankly, it is comical. If you, if you create a picture in your mind, it says that Peter went to this friend's house and he's on an outer, you know, there's an outer entrance, there's a courtyard and then where they, the living quarters would be and it says, Peter knocked on the outer entrance and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door and when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back out, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door, can you imagine that? Knock, 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 ah, it's Peter and poor Peter's out there, uh, yeah. <laughs> and she runs and she says, Peter's at the door. Now, these people that were earnestly praying to God for Peter, what did they say? You're out of your mind. Peter's not out there. Peter's in jail. God hasn't done anything. (laughs) You know, go back to sleep, whatever. And she kept insisting it was so. And, And so what did they say? Well, there must be an alternative answer because it can't be Peter. So it must be Peter's angel. In other words, they're probably suggesting that maybe Peter was dead. Maybe his guardian angel's here to tell us. <laughs> Peter's dead. You don't want much of a guardian angel, were you? <laughs> but Keith, Peter kept on knocking. He was persistent. He had something to share. And it says with that when they opened the door and they saw him, they were astonished. They were surprised by God. A good surprise. Versus James, who was executed. So there's a couple other things to note in our text today. And, and the first one is related to James. Why did God let James get killed and yet Peter to live? If you, if you look through the scriptures, you'll see that pa- Peter, James, and John were always part of the inner circle of Jesus. They witnessed his transfiguration. They had uh, private conversations with him. And I have to be honest with you and say, I I don't necessarily have a great answer for why James died and Peter lived. It would be the same question I'd have to ask about why did Stephen die a horrible death, faithfully proclaiming the gospel? Why have Christians throughout the ages and even today been tortured and killed for their faith? Wow, people are praying for them. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verses 19 through 20, as he was leading up to that final meal with his disciples, he said to them, if you belong to the world, 
it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, for I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Suffering can have an incredible positive impact on an individual. Think about your own lives, the things that you have gone through that have made you what you are today, that have strengthened you when times have gotten tough. Think about those times when you had no money and you were worried about how you were going to be able to put food on the table and how God provided. And by the way, it wasn't because he gave you steak. It was a struggle, but as a result of that, you learn to be strong. You learn, perhaps you learned how to budget, whatever might happen. Suffering can do a great deal of work in our lives. Faith under fire, quite frankly, is real faith. And people take notice when our faith is strong, even in times of difficulty. There was a soldier that stood guard during the crucifixion, and he saw the suffering of Christ. Mark chapter 15 tells us that when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Through suffering, he saw something bigger. This guy wasn't just an ordinary guy. Surely this was the son of God. We don't know what happened to that soldier afterwards, but something happened. We don't know what happened to the soldier who's ear was cut off by Peter during the arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. But he saw his ear healed. It made an impact on his life that the scriptures don't tell us about, but we can be sure it happened. I don't like suffering, but I'm often glad for the outcome after I go through it. The Apostle Paul had some problems in his life. It doesn't tell us exactly what it was, but he said, I had this thorn in my flesh that I continued to pray to God, take this away from me. And some people say it was his eyes were bad. We don't know. But there was something in his life, perhaps it, due to his health, that was, was bothering him. And he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. He was anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, he made his request known to God. And God did not take that away. And God said, my strength is sufficient. In your weakness, I am strong. So God uses suffering in some incredible ways that we probably won't really understand until we're on the other side of this world. Number two, God will only take you so far, and then you must act. In the example of Peter's miraculous escape from prison, we learn this. It says the angel struck Peter on the side, woke him up, get up, chains fell off, put on your clothes, put on your cloak, follow me. He, he passed through the guards he came to an iron gate that led into the city. It opened by itself, and it says then and they went through it. Here's the key. When they had walked through the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. <laughs> At some point, I must act on what God is doing. God says, here, I've delivered you here. I've, 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 I've helped you see that you fall short. I've shown you that Jesus Christ provided for you a salvation. I, I've forgiven your sins by what I did on the cross. What are you going to do with it? Am I just going to you know, hide? <laughs> Say, this is great. Can't wait to die because then I'll be with him. No, we're, 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 we have to act. God's going to open a door, but we must walk through it. The angel did everything possible to prepare Peter. Getting dressed, make sure you got a coat on. It might be cold out. But the angel departed, and Peter had to decide what to do next. What am I going to do? Am I going to say, oh, I probably shouldn't get out. I'll go back. No, Peter said, no, I, I, I need to go to where people are gathered and praying. I need to tell them what God did. And when he gets there, what did, it, what did he do? It says Peter motioned with his hand to the, to the people that had finally opened the door to them. He told them to be quiet. And he described how, God, how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And what's he say? Tell James and the brothers about this. 
And then he left for another place. So he encouraged them. He said, you need to tell the, other, the others about this. I want them to hear what's going on. And then he skedaddled. <laughs> he went on to do what God had called him to do, to continue to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. How often are you surprised by God? How often are you and I looking for God's movement in our lives and in the world? We tend to say, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I have a strategy. Yet we forget to see what God is already doing. If, if we were in a community that was filled with 50% people in wheelchairs, we wouldn't want to start a sports marathon ministry. We might want to see how can we serve these people that God has already put for us, before us. How can we be Christ in the midst of where we are? We need to see what God is doing. How often are you and I building up the faith of others by sharing what God has done in our lives, even when times are tough? Or do we just say, well, I got lucky. Yeah, that was really tough, but, you know, it passed. I, I made it through it. I'm tough. How many times are we building up other faith as well as revealing our faith to others by sharing what God is doing? And how quick are you and I to walk through the open doors that God gives us? Sometimes we, we don't like the door that's opened. <laughs> Have you ever heard the song? And, I, and I'm not. And just, it just kind of came to me just now, so I'm not going to remember the exact words. But it's a, it's kind of a humorous song that talks about, you know, Lord, I want to do whatever you want me to do. Send me where you want me to be, but please don't let it be Africa. <laughs> it's, I don't want to go there. You send me on a missions trip to Hawaii. Yeah. And sometimes God opens doors for us that we would never expect, and how quick are we to walk through them? Uh, one more thing. Many times you have heard people say, and, it, and it's scriptural, that God does not act because we didn't have enough faith. Oh, if you only had more faith. Matthew chapter 21, verse 22 says, If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. So based on that verse... Prayer or faith is a major factor to answered prayer. However, the motivation is equally important. 1 John chapter 5 says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask for anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we will have what we asked of him according to his will. The psalmist says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. What does it mean to delight in the Lord? It means that you delight in what delights the Lord. And so if my focus is on what, what pleases God, then I want to do things that please God. My, my, my prayers are not going to be self-gratifying. It's going to be, Lord, change us. Change this world. Bring us back to your, to your feet. Renew in us the joy of our salvation. Those are the kind of prayers. And God says, those are the prayers I'm going to answer. Because those are the prayers that bring glory to God. The last thing to think about is the relative to this idea of faith is the, the man that came to Jesus. His son had been possessed and, and it caused him to have a lot of difficulties. He couldn't speak, but it wasn't that he just was born mute. It was that he would convulse, and the spirit, it said, would throw him into fires and things like that. So it was very um, detrimental to his life. And, and, he, and this man took his son to the disciples, and, and they could not cash this, this demon out. And, and the man went to Jesus and said, hey, this is what's happened in my son's life. It's been this way since birth, and, and your, your, your disciples couldn't do anything about it. But Jesus, if you can, please help. Jesus' response was, if I can? <laughs> if I can? You're asking me if I can? You, yeah, I can. You just need to believe. The man's response was interesting. He said, Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. It's, it's 
it's easy to say I believe, but there's always those doubts. Help me in my unbelief. And Jesus' perfect will, God's perfect will was done. And that, that boy, the, the, the demon was cast out. The boy was back to being what he should be. But Jesus said, this one comes out by prayer. This, this one requires a focus. Are you praying? Am I praying? Am I praying earnestly, fervently? Am I praying for everything? Am I seeking out God in all the struggles in life as well as the victories in life? Am I proclaiming to people what God has done in my life? Am I proclaiming to people what God has done in the life of our church? Or am I just keeping it to myself, hidden in a room? God wants to answer our prayer. God wants to use us as his instruments, and prayer is the starting point that we need to focus on. Every once in a while, we're going to try to do it more regular. We have concerts of prayer in the evenings here. Usually it's been the third Thursday of a month. We'll announce another one in the near future. And that's when we should be praying for the community. That's when we should be praying for this, this nation because God can do incredible things when we pray. And he may surprise us at times when we see, I didn't think he answered the prayer my way. But there will be a time when we'll look back and we'll say, but God answered it all the same in a way that brought the most glory to him, the way that made the most change for the kingdom, that other people might turn to Jesus Christ. Lord God Almighty, thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord, that you have chosen to use us both to pray and to do. Almighty God, I pray that you'll help us to see the doors that you open, the plans that you have in place, the work that you're already doing, and that, Lord, we will seek prayerfully after you and watch how you surprise us. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand, if you will, as we reflect on the goodness of God. Running after, 
song, a reminder that God is good, even when things don't seem so good. God is in control. Almighty God, I pray that you'll watch over us and guide us. Lord, help us to see with spiritual eyes. Help us, Almighty God, to to recognize this world as you see it. Lord, a world you created in perfection, and Lord, you will bring it back to perfection, that we might see your face and we might see your glory. Almighty God, I pray that you'll be with each person here, that you'll direct their path and guide them, Lord. Show them the good, the bad, and the ugly, but bring them through it in every case, that we might glorify your name and tell others of all the good things you have done. And these things we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great, great week, and I hope to see you next Sunday.